you are the face of the NBA in Nigeria. Well, it takes, it, it literally took a village for us to pull that off with, I said, the visionary that is called Mark Tatum, the deputy commissioner of the NBA. Notable is that this was almost like a retaliation because few months before, Black Panther crew came to Lagos. <laughs> Why is that? What do you mean by retaliation? <laughs> what is that retaliation? Well, the US came, you took Africa it's to the US. <laughs> Clearly, for the majesty of all those events, sequencing them in such a short time since you took over, there has to be some dots in your past that prepared you for the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Life has a very interesting way, and I say God has a very interesting way of ensuring that you end up exactly where you're supposed right. to be. God is the ultimate craft master. Hey! Today's episode is supported by IRL, an original podcast for Mozilla, made for people who are into AI and people who build and develop tech policies. Listen to Mozilla IRL wherever you get your podcasts. For this season, IRL looks at people over profits. How do you build truly noteworthy and responsible artificial intelligence? What does innovation look like? when trillion dollar companies and investors aren't the one calling the shop and actually people come first. Welcome to Silverbacks Valley. I'm your host and my name is Ibrahim Sanya. We have an amazing guest today. But before that, a gentle reminder, press that subscribe button, join the community, meet founders and funders, changing sports, tech and entertainment from Africa to the rest of the world and never miss a thing. Enjoy. Bemisola, Bemisola. Glad to be here in Lagos with you in your home city. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for being here. Uh, last time we met, it had to be the Cairo or Kigali, but probably Kigali. Kigali, Kigali. It was BAL. Kigali. Yes, the finals. So you are the face of the NBA in Nigeria. You basically are the magic spice that took <laughs> Burner Boy, Thames, and Rema at the heart of the All-Star NBA. How does things like that happen? Okay. Um, well, it takes, it, it literally took a village for us to pull that off. Um, I think it's worth saying that, but it really began with, I said, the visionary that is called Mark Tatum, the deputy commissioner of the NBA. In November of last year, um, we hosted Mark Tatum in Nigeria. Um, we rolled out the MBA Meets platform, which is basically how we, um, we, we celebrate it. We started with MBA Meets Art more so, and MBA Meets Art is celebrating art through the lens of the MBA, and Mark Tatum was gracious enough to come to Nigeria. We invited him and he came. And while he was here, he really enjoyed just experiencing the rich heritage of um, Nigerian culture. And um, during that period, um, there was a time when he mentioned that we should take this, we should take this to the US, <laughs> take this to All Star. And um, I knew what he meant when he said that. And I didn't even realize that while he was in Lagos, he had sent an email. And a week later, I got an email um, from Mark. Um, he had sent an email to, I believe, the entertainment, MB Entertainment Group, and had me in copy and said for, um, for 2023 NBA All-Star, would like to do an Afrobeats themed um, halftime show. And that's how the incredible work began. That, that, that was pure magic, pure history, yeah. and pure pride. And um, what is Notable is that this was almost like a retaliation because few months before, Black Panther crew came to Lagos. <laughs> Why is that? What do you mean by retaliation? <laughs> what is that retaliation? Well, the U.S. came. You took Africa it's to the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. No, yeah, no. I think it was honestly it was truly remarkable in the history of the NBA All Star. We've not had an African artist, and to have three amazing African artists who are at the top of their game to really bring the African culture, bring the Nigerian culture to center stage at All Star. It was truly remarkable to be a part of that and to be able to, to have witnessed that. Yeah, no, it, uh, it was uh, phenomenal, but 
I uh, also recall you starting the launch of NBA Nigeria on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that event. So uh, I'm someone who always gives credit where credit is deserved, right? So um, that us um, putting a basketball court on a floating basketball court mm -hmm. on the Lake Ikoi Bridge. It was an idea that was conceived with the MBA and Hennessy. Um, there's an initiative that we had with Hennessy called Beyond Courts, mm. and the whole idea of putting basketball courts in very interesting places. And it just so happened that um, Lagos, Nigeria was the first place we had a floating basketball court on the, that partnership. Since then, it's been done in London. It's been done in, I believe, Sydney, Australia as well. But that was, I mean, that was a great way to make a splash to say that we're here in Nigeria. Yeah, so I got I my that. invite while being in, I don't know if it was in Dubai or Cairo, and I seriously debated rerouting <laughs> my flight <laughs> to attend. Yeah. No, but uh, clearly for the majesty of all those events, sequencing them in such a short time since you took over, there has to be some dots in your past that prepared you for the challenge. So tell us a bit about your origin and what in your past trail armed you, gave you the weapons to okay, be able right to, <laughs> <You> said, <"What?" laughs> to be able to, to be able to tackle this challenge. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, my story I was born in California, grew up in Nigeria, moved back to California for high school, what we call secondary school here. Um, while I was in secondary school in California, I always say I owe my love for basketball to my brother because I shared a space with my brother in California. And it was always a race to the remote. Who grabbed the remote first determined what would watch. And he happened to always grab the remote before I did. And all he wanted to watch was basketball and specifically Kobe watched, Bryant. Watched, no that was actually before Kobe like Magic. all he wanted to watch was Lakers play but when I, I mean I didn't have a choice I'll start watching it with him um, but there was a game we watched when Kobe I think after Kobe had been drafted Kobe was drafted mm -hmm. um, where he was drafted by the Charlotte Hornets but was um, traded to the Lakers and it's literally how I started watching um, basketball religiously I fell in love with the personality that was Kobe Bryant I was taken away by this young man who just had just had such clarity about who he was what he wanted to achieve in life he was young and most people sort of discredited the way he saw life at that age because he was really young and I could identify a lot to that because I felt like um, when I was young I was very inquisitive I might say at that age, I felt like I was wise beyond my years, but it was easily dismissed like, oh, she doesn't have experience. She doesn't know what she's talking about. So I could identify with him when he would talk about like the way he saw his future, that clarity of, of self and clarity of, of life purpose. He really had that clarity. And that's how I stayed following basketball religiously. Moved to um, Wyoming um, for college and um, when I was in Wyoming, I spent a lot of time when I was watching the basketball games in school, watching football games, and I really just got taken um, by basketball, got a chance to develop an amazing relationship with the Nigerian players on the basketball team, who literally, I would say in the long run, in a very, very interesting way, they're the ones who introduced me to the African basketball community, because after I left college, um, when I moved to D.C., um, you had someone from the um, team there who had introduced me to someone in in DC and literally I would say that's kind of how the journey of in terms of me being immersed in the basketball world but the truth is I mean I think I've had a very interesting professional background not your typical um, professional background um, while I was in undergrad I took a marketing class and I just found marketing interesting mind you at that point my idea was while I was in school was pre-law mm. the idea was to be a lawyer but after taking the marketing class, I just found it very interesting, the idea of being able to establish an emotional connection with people, I mean, with a brand, with anything. And I just, I was really interested in that. So I applied to a, a program at Disney mm. in Orlando. So I did an internship um, mm. at Disney for six months, um, my junior year of um, college. And I really, I mean, it's you're living in Orlando, just truly amazing experience. Mm. You're living with other international students and you're working 
at Disney. And what I did then was like marketing research. So when I came back and went to school, literally laser focused on graduating, still had the intention of going to law school, you know, but I know I've been bitten by the marketing bug, if I have to be honest. Moved to DC, worked at a law firm in DC, amazing experience, um, developed incredible friendships. And like I said, DC was, DC was the place where I really got immersed into the African basketball community. It's where I met the likes of, it's where I met Masai Ujiri, it's where Very I met guy. Obine Kize, and they all became really good friends, friends of mine. They looked out for me, I'll put it mm. that way. After I left DC, I moved to Chicago for a little bit, and I think it's always worth telling the story that when I moved to Chicago, I moved to Chicago with the intention of going to Northwestern University for the JD MBA program. Your average human being will wait to find out they've been accepted before they move. I was waitlisted and I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna move to Chicago. If I get in, I get in. If I don't, I'll do it all over again. And I moved to Chicago and I get to Chicago and I find out I didn't get it. <laughs> So it's like, okay, we gotta find a job now and reapply to grad school. And during that period, I discovered, I discovered an incredible um, business school. I really wanted to go to a school that gave me the opportunity to really like study things from a global standpoint because I always saw myself as a global citizen. I always saw myself as somebody that you put me anywhere mm -hmm. and I can make it home then mm -hmm. Got accepted to Thunderbird School of Global Management, got a scholarship cool. to go there, moved to Arizona for grad school. And what was, what made Thunderbird is such an interesting phase of my life because it really gave me the opportunity to express mm. um, and really experience and learn things from an international standpoint, meaning I got a chance to study in Prague. I did a program in, um, in South Africa. I got the opportunity to do a consulting work in Jordan, the Jordanian mm. government. So you're doing all of that. And the one in Jordan was actually the most exciting because when you talk about what I do today, I, I literally go back and think about that. And I think about that because the work in Jordan was combining mark, it was combining business and development. Mm. And I always felt like that was something like, I wanted to be a lawyer more so because of that whole developmental element of it. I was interested in human rights to be specific, but after discovering marketing, I fell in love with marketing, but the work we did in Jordan, where it was like country branding, how do you mm. position a country to attract high value investment? to increase the life, the, sta the life of the standard, the standard life of a Jordanian. And it was very interesting for me to sort of find that merge of both. I was convinced country branding was what I was going to do. This is what I was made for, you know, development and marketing. And I go back to the US, cause I, I was in Amman for a little bit, go back to the US and while I'm planning, I'm like, I'm speaking to people at the World Bank. I mean, all these different um, organizations and institutions that do country branding. Um, but during that period, like they say, man plants and God disposes. I meet the a random night out with friends. I meet the CEO of Louis Vuitton. And the rest is history is how I ended up working for Louis Vuitton in a management program. After business school, um, had the privilege of being part of the team that opened um, the now largest um, store in North America in Las Vegas, City Center. And from there, I found my way back after I left Louis Vuitton. Um, I think my, my father passed during that period and my father always wanted me to move to Nigeria. Thank you, always wanted me to move to Nigeria. So I was looking for different, I was thinking about, I'm gonna say looking, looking for different, thinking about different opportunities in Nigeria. And an opportunity came about with a luxury company and I moved to Nigeria. And as you say, the rest is history. <laughs> hey. Remember to search Mozilla IRL in your podcast player or look up IRL Podcast at ORG. IRL Podcast at ORG. We'll also include a link in our show notes. Big thanks to the IRL team for their support. We are big fans. <laughs> no, it's amazing in your path to see what looks not obvious from far, but it's actually quite obvious. Absolutely. Because uh, people tend to look at luxury and sport on a separate land space, but effectively they're very close to twins. Yeah. Because they're fundamentally hinge on being able to attract an audience 
-hmm. build a loyalty that starts with something that akin to love, but is actually adoration slash devotion. Mm. And in, in, there's a definition of luxury uh, that says that when you are attracted to a product, you like it. Mm. When you tolerate the defects of the product or the person, mm -hmm. you love them. Mm, you love it. Yeah. So it's seeing beyond the attribute. Yeah. But there's a level above liking, mm -hmm. which is adoration. When you adore a product, in the case of luxury, yeah. you go beyond the definition of the product, you go beyond the limitation, and you focus on the lifestyle of a, and the yeah. signal it states about you. So yeah. that's the case for luxury, but it's also the case for sports. Yeah. That's why you will see individuals pick a team. I mean, all the Africans that pick an NBA team who never went to the US, yeah. who are full fans of whether Chicago Bulls or LA never yeah. went to any of the two countries. That's the same phenomenon. The product is not doing anything directly to you. But yeah. yet, whether the team lose or win, you're, you're because that is the fu that's the functionality, right? Yeah. But irrespective of that delivery of fun of pro of the outcome, you still are loyal to that brand. Yeah. And it is that similarity. And obviously, when you were taking this path, that journey, nothing was saying if you were going to do a training for your CV that you need to do this in order to get there, but you can see how it consolidates today. I mean, I always say that's life though. I mean, honestly, I think it's one of the things that I, I fundamentally believe that, I mean, it's, I always say follow your passion, follow the things that drive you. And in the long run, you end up where you're supposed to end up. I fundamentally yeah. believe that. Yeah. Because for me, for a while, it was following my love for marketing, my passion for marketing. And what you described that's marketing, it's how do you create a desire for your product to who the consumers are. You need to understand trends. I mean, that's applicable on so many fronts. And for the longest time, it was me following my passion for marketing. And in so doing that, um, and then following my passion for basketball, it's how I was able to develop all these great relationships within the space where it's following what you love. I had a lot of interesting conversation. I think one thing people don't know, and I think it's, it's I should say, in 2013, I actually had a conversation with Amadou. Like Amadou had said, you know what? We need to find a way to bring you into the MBA as a talent. He did. And interestingly, by the time I got the job that brought me to Nigeria, I remember calling Amadou and telling Amadou, I was like, I just got a real cool job in Nigeria and I'm gonna take the job. And he was like, oh, that's great. He's like, I'm sure one day we'll figure something out. and. That was left, I mean, did that job, did another job, then the, I got it, I mean, I found out about this position with the MBA in 2021. So I, I find that with life, as long as you, I, I mean, it's so, it's so cliche to say trust the process, yeah, but it's but that it's thing just, within you that you're following your passion, you're following what drives you, and in so doing, life has a very interesting way, and I say God has a very interesting way of ensuring that you end up exactly where you're supposed where to be. Where are you supposed to be? Yeah. No, no. God is the ultimate craft master. Absolutely. <laughs> and Rumi has a saying which goes, which we often use in the program, which is that which you're seeking is seeking you. It, absolutely. I, yeah. And it's really summarized what you've just You know what, the, the, the other, other way I've heard it said, it's from the book, The Alchemist, where it says, um, like the universe will conspire to, to give you what you want. And I, and I really believe that, that that's life. Well, uh, with you following your journey, here you are. Yes. On the top 100 leaders in Sports Illustrated women. And the awards are just adding up and adding up. And it's a lot of responsibility on the shoulder. Uh, and as now you have Nigeria that is blossoming, what are the plans for the near future because a lot of rest, <laughs> see a lot of responsibilities honestly i i don't i mean one thing i see about my job i see my job there are two things it's i have my responsibility to the mba to grow the footprint of um, our business in nigeria and increase the footprint of basketball 
but I also see it as a duty to my country. I'll mm. be very honest. I think it's a very interesting platform that you sort of kill two birds with one stone. You get the opportunity to work for an amazing organization mm. like the NBA, mm. and you get the opportunity to serve your country. Yeah. It's, it's the way I say it. And when I say serve my country, I mean, we talked about the all-star. That is kind of serving your country, an interesting opportunity, looking at how we can utilize our programs in Nigeria as a tool for nation building. Absolutely. And it's literally letting people know the importance of the work we're doing here in Nigeria that as we, people think basketball, it's beyond basketball. Like beyond basketball, basketball is a priority for us, but it's beyond basketball for the programs we do that impacts the youth, we ensure that it instills life skills. The curriculum is designed to instill life skills. I'm talking about not just like life skills that are instrumental to their development as, as human beings and life skills that will stay with them for the rest of their life, you know? So it's if you really look at it, those are tools for nation building. It's oh, like you're absolutely. planning and you're, you're building the next generation of leaders in a country. So it's the way I see the work we're doing. So for us, it's... Um, when you ask, like, what are we doing? Um, sort of like, I'll say a strategic roadmap for me is like you create a desire, then you, the affinity, going back to, because once people see what it is we're doing, people like basketball. People don't realize that when, after football in Nigeria, the yeah, next basketball. sport is basketball. Absolutely. So you already have that interest in the sport. Now it's like, how do you deepen that interest by turning that interest to a desire, where they have a desire for it, the one to engage with an affinity. And for us, it's by, there are multiple ways of doing that. One of the key ways we're doing that is we're working along culture. Mm. And when I say working along culture is fashion, film, music, art, and tech being the fifth pillar of culture for us. So it's how are we building the brand along that? Because when you think about the NBA, the NBA has that convening power. That's what we do everywhere in the world. Absolutely. It's not, what I'm saying is not unique to Nigeria. This is what the NBA does in the US as, as well. Product, so yeah. it's like, how do we localize that? You take that same concept, how do you localize that and, and, and really make that relevant, make the brand culturally relevant in Nigeria? So that's one Then with basketball. I mean, it's, it's not, I think most people know this, like you see a lot of players in the NBA who have Nigerian names. In the history of the NBA, you've had about, about 120 players of African heritage. About half of those have been Nigerians. That tells you something. Tells you I mean, something. The, the season that's about to start, we have about 20, 19 to 20 players in the current season that's about to start that are of Nigerian descent. So that tells you that from a talent standpoint, mm. there's a lot of people, a lot of young kids here in Nigeria who were gifted and talented, how do we ensure that we're, we're giving them the opportunity to hone their skills mm. and to become not just basketball players, to get the opportunity to play basketball at the highest level, but the truth of the matter is there's so many opportunities that exist mm. beyond just being a basketball player, whether it's sports medicine, whether it's sports marketing, whether it's sports management. Oh. So literally just showing the different facets and the different opportunities that exist. So those are the things we're doing, like we're building value for the brand, but building value for our partners as well, you know, yeah. in Nigeria, you know, uh, making sure that we're creating assets that appeal to our, um, our partners in the market. So, so far, so good. Um, I really, I find it, it's a very interesting challenge to me. I don't think there's any challenge I've, I've encountered in life that I back down from. And this is Clearly. one that's quite interesting. <laughs> Clearly, judging from your past, I'm not worried about your future. <laughs> it's interesting that you talk about the, the country, um, the country building branding, because as we are having this chat, you may have heard that Saudi Arabia, it's another testimony to your words to see how that one specific country mm. has basically cleared the message, because obviously there's a lot to be gained from positioning your country around sports. So I think, I mean, I, I, I honestly fundamentally believe that sports is the most powerful tool. If it's harnessed properly, whether it's from a country branding for youth development, nation building, there's so many things that you can do with sports. And that's why I find that in our job, I always say sports diplomacy is important yes. because people don't know. So it's our responsibility to sort of educate them and explain to them the importance of sports. In most developed countries where they've been able to harness the power of sports, sports contributes about 5% to their GDP, mm. right? That's not the case for a lot of African countries at the Absolutely. moment. So it's for us to, to, for those of us who are practitioners within the sports industry, for us to let 
government see the different opportunities that exist, letting them know that this is an area they should take seriously. seriously. One thing I would say is with, with the Nigerian government, for example, last July, sports was reclassified from being recreational. For the longest time, sports was not seen as an industry. Mm -hmm. It was just seen as recreational, but it's been reclassified as an industry of its own. What does that mean? Good. That means there are several what's it called, incentives and tax benefits yeah, and things come. that are going to come to that. So things like that, sort of like heading in the right direction, letting them know the importance like sports tourism. I mean, you've been to Kigali whenever yeah. we've hosted the BAL there. You can see what that does Absolutely. for Kigali when everybody's there. So it's really just educating. I really think that's a big part of the educating and saying, this is a really powerful tool for, from a business standpoint, from a unity standpoint. I mean, yes, no one can- a unifier. Like, what um, Nelson Mandela said it best when he was like, sports unites people like no other. No like other. It's, the, it's, the, it's the language of the youth. And we know when Nelson Mandela became the president of South Africa, what rugby. did he use? He used sports, sports. rugby. So it's, it's that really just communicating and showing people that. Then also showing people like the sustainability of the business of sports. Yes. That further um, drives home the point that, okay, you know what? From a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint, developmental standpoint for kids, that's for the future of the country. Here are the benefits of sports. But from a business standpoint, standpoint. here's how this can contribute to the development of a country. From an economic standpoint, it's, it's really, and I truly believe that a lot of countries will come along and see it because if you look at when the BAL started to where the BAL is now, you have several yeah. countries that want to build arenas because they want to attract us to ensure that we can play, um, play in their countries as well. So a big part of the responsibility of that, honestly, um, it's on us. And the fact that you have countries like Rwanda, countries like Saudi Arabia, really showing yeah, the, way. the way and showing like how you can utilize sports, I think it's only a matter of time that a lot of the governments within Africa as well will embrace sports as a tool for them for nation building, as a tool for development, and as a tool for economic growth because it's an economic growth engine. Amen, amen to that. That's full music to our ears. Now, going back to Benny Salah. To Benny Salah. <laughs> what is the biggest misconception people have about you and why do you think that oh is? Oh my gosh, biggest misconception, let me see. Um, oh, that's a great question. I think there are many, actually. Um, I think, like, I mean, I mentioned, like, I'm someone who's, I'm very sure of self, very confident. Um, I'm bold. I'm unafraid of challenges. Um, and sometimes it's, um, I'm trying to say big, biggest misconception. That rubs some people off the wrong way sometimes. I think that's what it will, it's people, um, it rubs some people off the wrong way. Some people might take it to be something that it's not. Mm. Whereas it's, um, I always say, I'm on a mission. Like I have a clear idea of why God put me on earth. And when you have that clarity on your purpose, everything you do, it's not, you don't do things for the sake of doing it, you know? So your because intent. like it's, it's your, your intentional and some people, it, that might not sit well with some people where people would think maybe, I don't know, like it can, it's, it's it, sometimes it's, is misconstrued to mean something that it's not. Whereas the reality is, um, I just really have a clear purpose. I have a clear vision. I'm a person of excellence and I don't shy away from saying that if something is being done, I need to make sure it's done well and at the best level possible. Some people might see that as being a perfectionist. I'm like, that's not being a perfectionist. I'm like, if it can be done well, it needs to be done at the level it should be done. To me, it's like if you set the bar very high for yourself, um, the odds of you reaching that um it only increase i think will increase so um so I, I i would say that you know i have a personal mantra that i live by i coined this about 10 years ago um, i always say to live it's my compass in life to live a rich and fulfilled fulfilled life that pleases god while impacting the world around me when i coined this 10 years ago i'm like anything wow. that distracts from that i'm wow. not interested Wow, wow. Like that's, 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 be that's beautiful. Yeah. I'll have to borrow it. There's <laughs> one from, uh, I think it's James Baker, the US, which is prior, prior preparation uh, prevents failure. Yeah. So, which is similar to, this, to the same idea. Who has been your biggest influence now that you've divulged your perfectionist 
So I'm not a perfectionist. I know. No, that's I'm why I'm saying it. I was, it was just to pick, pick on you. <laughs> I'm not a perfectionist. I am, I must, I'm someone in pursuit of excellence, mm. not perfection. Perfectionist means that it has to be perfect and nothing in life is perfect. Yes. However, although nothing in life is perfect, it's not an excuse not to pursue excellence and have things done properly. So, <laughs> pursuit of excellence. Pursuit of excellence. My biggest, honestly, um, I have several people who have influenced me in my life. Um, my faith is a central part of who I am, which is why I would say to live a rich and fulfilled life that pleases God. Like, it's the, it's the cornerstone of everything I do. It's so important. I believe and I'm convinced from having the privilege to live the life I've lived and the experiences and opportunities I've had is my life is divinely orchestrated and I really just, I thank God. I mean, I never shy away from backing down that my faith has really been what has kept me grounded. And in spite of all the challenges and obstacles that are thrown at you and on a daily basis in life, it's like that keeps you grounded because you know why God put you here. But with that faith, I mean, I go back to my parents. Um, my mother, probably played a huge role in instilling this faith that I have. And my father, oh my goodness, I miss that man so much. I'll probably say my confidence and just that clarity and sureness of self, I believe that comes from him because mm. as at a young age, my dad encouraged me to be inquisitive. My father would give me books at a young age to read. Like my father was, my father loved Shakespeare. Like at a young age, I knew Shakespeare plays. I could read them because my father encouraged that. So I would probably say my parents um, would be the, the top two that come to mind. But honestly, I've been so privileged that I've had so many people pour into me. Even as I, in this role, I can't talk about this role without talking about the likes of Masai Ujiri. His support uh, um, as a friend um, in terms of trying to figure out things sometimes. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is what I'm trying to deal with. How, how do I navigate this? And, and having that privilege to have someone like him um, as a friend who sort of pours into you as well. Um, I've had so many, honestly, like mm. I can think of like my history teacher in, 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 in high school. This is how crazy it is. Like for me, I'm someone who I believe that when it says it takes a village to raise takes someone, I truly believe that I've had so many people. I have friends of mine who I lean on, who pour into my life as well. So I have friends who pour into my life. I have family members. When I moved to California, I lived with my uncle and aunt in California mm. and they were very instrumental in making sure that, you know what, when it was summertime, you were home and all of uh, were just supporting you. So I have, and basketball from my mentality standpoint, honestly, I, I gotta say Kobe Bryant. It's, it's, it's like, you have those people who influence <laughs> the mumba you. Mentality. mentality. Who influence you from a distance. And those two people that I can think of that who influenced me significantly from a distance, the first one is definitely Kobe Bryant. I just, that discipline, that laser focusness, that not giving into distraction and like distractions are just noise, you know, that kind of, that I, I really embodied that and really mm. believed in it, you know? So that thinking, you know, like when I was younger and his interviews, I would listen to his interviews. I'm like, yes, I, I know, I feel what <laughs> I you're saying. I know what you're saying, you know what bro, I mean, I feel I mean you. I'm not gonna say I can identify with him, <laughs> definitely not, I couldn't, but I just, it resonated with yes. me and I saw it as a way to live life, you know? Um, mm. The story of someone like Nelson Mandela, I, re I reference Nelson Mandela often because when I was younger, I used to read everything there was about Nelson Mandela, so impacted by him. If you talk about the history of Nigeria, I'm telling you the likes of, I love strong women, mm. women who have been able to challenge status quo and really just shift the needle, that mm. matters to me. People like your Fumilaya Ransom Kuti, like mm. there's so many people that, mm. whether mm. it's from, whether it's Nigerian, African, or just global, I've been able to, to literally, I've been, always been a sponge and take something from everyone. Well, it takes a village. Clearly, it takes a village for Bemi Sola. Bemi Sola had a chance to speak to the 17 year old Bemi. Yes. What would you say to that little soul? So my seven, 17 years old, I was a sophomore in college, um, second year of college. So I started, uh -uh. Uh -uh. I, I started uh -uh. college you at sk 16. You skipped some years, just yeah, like I, I did. I did. <laughs> so you skipped some years. I skipped some grades, yes. Yeah, I, I started college at 16. So all I tell my 17-year-old um, self, who was a sophomore in college, I would say relax, it's all gonna work out. 
You know, um, I took life very seriously when I was young. I mean, I have no idea where I was. I mean, my dad used to say, where are you rushing to? He's like, relax. Like, I took life very seriously. I was very intentional about when I was in college, where I was like, I have to make sure I have a resume, the type of resume that will ensure that I get a great job at a law firm when I graduate. So I'm like, I need to have a big brand on my resume because big brands want to see big brands and small brands want to see big brands. I literally would tell her to just, breathe in and understand that it's all going to play out and more so I think the most important thing I would stress to her is the gift of now. I always say my father's death gave me the gift of now. Really understanding that sometimes in life all you have is now. Mm -hmm. So don't be too rot, don't be too in a haste to get to the next phase of life mm -hmm. or get to some, to the next thing that you don't give yourself the opportunity to truly sit in mm -hmm. and enjoy where you are. So I would tell her that like enjoy being in college. Don't worry. Post college is going to be sorted out. Post all of that is going to be sorted out. So just enjoy being in college because did I enjoy college a little bit, but not as much. I was just very, very focused on what happened next. Hey, if you liked today's story, press like, leave a comment, subscribe, come back for more stories from the founders and the funders changing sports, tech, and entertainment from Africa to the rest of the world. We look forward to seeing you again soon.